Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in a prayer for illumination. Dear Lord, please grant us your wisdom as we read your word this morning. May we grow in understanding of you and your love. Amen. This morning's unison reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 692 of the Old Testament. After 20 chapters of speaking prophecies about Israel's deliverance and deliverer, the prophet Isaiah describes the future of Jerusalem, which had seemed, or using vivid imagery of the vindication of Jerusalem, which had seemed forsaken by God. Notice in verses 4 the names given to Jerusalem, my delight, and married. And notice in verse 5 the rejoicing at the prospect of an upcoming marriage. We will repeat the wedding theme in our reading from John's Gospel. Please join me in this morning's unison reading, Isaiah 62, 1 through 5. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nation shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and you shall, and shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. This morning's second reading comes from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It can be found on your pew Bible on page 93 of the New Testament. Jesus brings joy to a wedding feast in Cana when the wine runs out. This, his first miracle, reveals publicly that Jesus has the power to transform lives and bring new hope amidst powerlessness or concerns. Jesus replaces emptiness with abundance. Please follow along as I read John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. Weddings were such emotionally intense times that even the smallest problems set people off, sometimes for the worst, sometimes to great laughter. Through 40 plus years of conducting weddings, I've learned to expect anything and to laugh through the things that do go wrong. From drop rings, to fainting bridesmaids, to artificial candles that spit up like rockets, to misbehaving ring bearers and tongue-tied grooms, At one wedding we were doing, the groom became so flustered he couldn't say his vows, and he finally just said, you say them for me, preacher. So my colleague Morris turned them into questions to which the groom just nodded his head each time. 
At one wedding here, a woman answered her cell phone twice and had conversations during the, wed the whole funeral wedding service. Lay down in the aisle of the pew as if we couldn't see her, we couldn't hear her. When she finished her conversation, she sat back up and watched the rest of the service. The one wedding here, the little boy was ring bearer, was intrigued by the uh, bride's train on the floor, and he decided, could he jump the brook? So he jumped across, and then jumped back, and he jumped across, and he jumped back, until Dad reached out from the front pew and grabbed him in midair. And I want to say, good catch, good catch. <laughs> They're prime examples of getting caught off guard and getting caught up in the moment. So how fitting a place for Jesus to start his ministry, his public ministry, and his first miracle down at a wedding. Today's reading from Isaiah 62 portrays the relationship with God and our people as marriage. And he proclaims his love and his devotion to us and changing our names from desolate and forsaken to delight and married. There's a problem in the wedding at Cana, though, you've just read about. They're running out of wine, and in Jewish hospitality culture, it was a sacred duty to have enough for your people and to run out what can be humiliating for the family. And so Jesus' mother pulls him aside and says, they're running out of wine. And in the, all the years I've preached on this passage, I've usually followed the prevalent train of thought that his response to her, woman, what have I to do with you and this? as more a denial of her request. The time has not come for Jesus to perform miracles. He's just starting his public ministry. He's going to use miracles later to produce, prove his identity as the Son of God who is in their midst to be able to do these things and to run up against his opponents. But for a trivial task, miracles are not meant for trivial task. But this week I reread William Barclay's commentary on John, in which he says his reply was not a denial of his, her request, nor a reproach of her, but more of, a, of an indication of a misunderstanding. Barclay suggests he's responding, don't worry. You don't quite know what's going on here. Leave it in my hands, and I will deal with this in my own way. He was simply telling her, leave it with me. I'll handle this in a different way. So then he performs his first miracle in public, turning water into wine, thereby saving a humble Galilean family from humiliation or hurt. So his first miracle was an act of kindness, of, of sympathy, of understanding what it meant for this family, of help understanding simple folks face everyday challenges. I think this miracle story also shows the beauty of Mary's love and trust in Jesus. She turned to her son whenever something was wrong and she was in great need. Have you learned to do the same? When you turn to Jesus for help, you will not find him lacking. He brings the abundance of God's grace to your need. Obviously, Mary didn't know what Jesus intended to do. She just meant they're running out of wine. What can we do? But she trusted him so much that she told the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. She trusted him even when she didn't understand. She trusted him to do the right thing. Have you learned to trust him as well? Have you come to know Jesus so well that you trust him to do his right, what is right, even when you don't understand what has happened or, or why it has happened or really what to make of it? But happy are you when you learn to trust Jesus even when you cannot understand. And what you know of miracles, they point beyond themselves to something greater, not just the act, but what does this act show? And Jesus told her, my hour has not yet come. Which is, what? But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is always on a constant progression toward his hour. His hour of crucifixion and death. 
And all through his life, Jesus knew that's what he came to fulfill, God's will, to put into place God's plan of salvation, which involved his death and his resurrection. Jesus didn't see his life in terms of his own wishes and dreams and desires, but of God's plan to witness God's reconciling love and the salvation he has given us. All through his life and ministry in the scriptures, he's leading toward that hour, and it gets closer and closer and more and more intense. You see his struggle to determine to do and to follow through. Wine as at a reception is not an eternal crisis, but in changing water that was there for purification rites where people washed their hands and their feet when they came into worship and prepare for the feast that was to come. Jesus is giving a sign of the purification that he has come to accomplish for us, and it's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that we will enjoy with God. So you and I are not just to think of our own desires and our own wishes, but to think also of God's purpose for our lives and how we may bless others. What can you do to prosper the kingdom of God, given what you have? How do you use your talents, your abilities, your interests, your influence, your friendships, your circles? Have you discovered God's abundance in your life that when you think, how in the world can I do this? Somehow you do. And then God uses you for the good of others as well. Repeatedly throughout the Bible, the imagery of a wedding is used to portray God's work in the lives of his people. In, in Isaiah 62, which we just read, God promises to wed the desolate people of Israel and to bring them out. In Hosea 2, Hosea portrays God reclaiming his wife who is playing the harlot, the prostitute, and he brings her back home and renews their vows yet again. In the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. In our hymn, the church is one foundation. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his life he bought her, and for her life he died. Despite our sinfulness, our unfaithfulness, our lack, God repeatedly forgives us. He maintains his commitment to us. He renews his vow to us. And the wedding feast continues when you think it's about to end. But God promises in Isaiah, to, he fulfills in Jesus Christ, and he invites us into relationship with him to be wed, to be married, to be God's delight. God chooses us. God loves us. God delights in us. God marries us. But after the wedding, you have to live out the marriage. Do whatever he tells you, Mary says. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do better. Sometimes we do worse. We're richer. We're poorer. We know sickness and health. And at times we struggle to honor our vows to God, but by holding fast to one another and to Christ, who is the bridegroom of the church, we do the difficult. We accomplish the demanding. We do well, and we know God's delight, and we feel good about ourselves. The water becomes wine, and we are made whole. We are lovely, and we are beloved. And Jesus transforms us and gives us a new aim, a new goal in life, a new sense of direction for our lives, a new motivation for our lives. Alfred Luckett once told of a young woman, Ann Walker Fern, who went to China as a missionary, a medical missionary, and Anne's mother was terrified about her travel to China, so she gave her money with which to wire home upon her safe arrival, a telegram, and just to send the one word, safe. Anne spent the money on the cablegram, just as she was expected, but rather than wire home safe, she wired home delighted. A much better word to describe the Christian outlook because many people spend their lives just being safe, safe, safe. There's little delight in living only for yourself. 
the delight comes when you know that you can influence and support and enrich others. Turning from myself and my passion to my mission is a vital step of turning the bland water into robust wine. So I was intrigued when this passage was suggested as a stewardship text. I don't know that I've ever seen John 2, 1 through 11, the wedding feast, used as a stewardship sermon on generosity. Normally the lectionary prescribes that on the third Sunday in January, the Sunday following the baptism of the Lord, where Jesus is now beginning his public ministry. And each January we focus on our resolutions, the new life to come, it's a new beginning, expectations the new year is going to bring something different. And so I was challenged that the stewardship resources we chose for this year suggested this passage for this Sunday. But the writers of that stewardship guide suggest that Mary has confidence that Jesus will produce something different, some blessing of abundance. And they ask, do you have the same confidence that your faith will produce abundance? Hmm. Because generosity transforms lives. Generosity transforms the desperate wedding into one of joy and community. The family and the village are blessed as well as the couple. Our faithful giving, even in the smallest of gifts, still touch and transform the lives of other people around the world. So I ask you to consider generosity as a fresh start to a new season this fall. And to realize that in becoming generous, you are doing as the Master tells you. And people's needs are being met. Sometimes through the peace offering. Sometimes through the other things that we do. Month to month and week to week and day to day. We're taking care of other people's needs. With our gifts large and small. Mary trusted Jesus to resolve the situation that had arisen. We trust Jesus to meet our needs. And we also trust Him to multiply our blessings, our gifts, as they are joined with other people's gifts to do magnificent things and really to do miracles in the lives of other people around us and to glorify God. And so because of that, we invest in the building of the kingdom of God together, building it up. Our giving demonstrates our thanks to God for God's abundance in our lives and that we intend to call out our, live out our calling as witnesses of God's abundance and blessings. Blessings come to us in very surprising ways sometimes. And sometimes the instructions Jesus gives don't make sense. And so we resist obeying him because what he requires of us may be more than we're willing to give up or we don't want to change. But still, as best we can discern and do as the Master tells us, we benefit and blessings still abound. But sometimes the confusion is because of our expectations and our assumptions. I love the story of a woman's mother coming to visit, and for breakfast the first morning she made tea for her mother and coffee for herself. And her mother said, I wish you wouldn't do that. I really prefer to have coffee. But mother, you, you always drank tea at breakfast when I was growing up. True, she said. Before I was married, I, I, I used to have coffee at breakfast, but I found out that your father likes tea better. And so it was, why well, go to the extra effort to make both? So I just made tea. The daughter said, but mom, after 37 years of marriage, don't you think you deserve? You can have coffee if you want coffee. So they enjoyed coffee during a visit. And then when the mother went back home, she started making coffee for herself and still tea for her husband. And after a week or so, the husband looked up from breakfast and said, how, how is it you get to have coffee and I have to have tea? <laughs> All because of their assumptions. You don't have to be married long, though, to find out you have misunderstandings and don't quite understand. A Craigslist ad Red Suzuki motorcycle for sale, bike in perfect condition, 1,000 miles on it, had the 500-mile dealer service, expensive. It's been adult-ridden, and all the wheels have always been on the ground, no jumping. I used it as a cruiser, commuter. 
I'm selling it because it was purchased without proper consent of my loving wife. <laughs> Apparently, do whatever you want doesn't mean what I thought. <laughs> Ask for Steve. Somewhat, Jesus tells us, doesn't make sense. After all, how is filling 180 gallons of water going to solve the problem of wine at a wedding? But some of what Jesus tells us is clear. And we know that it's still God's will that we take care of our relationships. Maintain your relationships and do everything you can to enrich one another. Honor your father and mother. Honor your parents. Honor your children. Maintain your friendships. You stay in touch with them and stay involved. And he calls us to forgive one another and to encourage one another and to pray for one another and to build up one another and to, to instruct one another. Constantly remind your friends how much you love them. Because the Master tells us to love one another and encourage one another. And again, to forgive one another and to share with one another and to pray for one another and to help one another and to share one another's burdens and to instruct one another and to do when we do what our master tells us we discover hidden blessings and miracles do occur take care of your relationships and also take care of your responsibilities do what the master tells you mary said do what jesus commands you you may not always understand it but it's for your own good and for the benefit of others whether at work or at school, or at church, or at home, or in civic clubs, or around the neighborhood. When we fail to meet our responsibilities, it leads to problems, and it makes us feel guilty, make us even feel shameful. And we can explain, and we can apologize, but eventually we have to face up to not make meeting our responsibilities, and it's a painful lesson to learn. But when you obey God's commands, and when you obey the Scriptures, and when you honor Christ in the way you live and how you speak and how you think and how you act, when you take care of your relationships and your responsibilities, blessings abound and often in unexpected, unexpected places or ways. Because don't you love the way the wedding at Cana ended? The head waiter tasted the wine taken from the water jars and he said, you served the best for last? That's one of the great messages of the New Testament. When you seek to live as God wants you to live, he saves the best for last. Things work out better when you do what Christ commands. God answers prayers in the ways we never expected, but it turned out the way it needed to, just as Mary trusted Jesus to do what is right. God works in mysterious ways, and the results are the best for us. And some of those folks here can attest your best years have been your later years. A lifetime of seeking to do God's will in their lives have made for fulfilling lives that they've learned to appreciate the blessings and to recognize the good that comes. As you take care of your relationships and your responsibilities and being generous, more than likely, your last years will be your best years. God will rejoice over his people, says Isaiah. He'll rejoice as the bridegroom will rejoice over his bride, and we shall be given a new name, a new identity, Hepzibah, my delight, Beulah, married. Christ transforms us into new wine, and we bring others delight. So ring the wedding bells and raise your glass. The party has just begun, and the best is to come. Amen and amen. God, it's all that easy, but sometimes it's so hard to trust and to know what is right. It doesn't make sense. How does water, what, what? But help us to do what you command, and we will discover the benefits and the blessings and the abundance of your grace. Amen and amen. Our affirmation of faith is from the Second Helvetic Confession. Maybe not one you know so well, but a Swiss confession in our hist history. And notice the imagery of the bride.